Quite a comeback for the New York Mets. Six runs in the bottom of an I gotta see this game. If it wasn't for this guy, we could get out of here. It's traffic killer, ain't it? You wanna get out of here? This is what we do. We leave the car here. We take the plates off. We scratch a serial number off the engine block, and we walk away. Walk away? You've got insurance. You tell them that the car was stolen, and then you get another one free. Isn't there a deductible? All right, what is your deductible? I don't know. Yes, because they've already deducted it. From what? The car, which we're leaving. So the net is zero. See, you pocket the money, if there is any, and you get a new car. We're not leaving the car. <laughs> Americans on average will spend nearly five and a half years of their lives in a car. Now that's a lot. In China in 2010, one of the biggest traffic jams in history took place on Highway 110. The jam lasted 10 days, with some drivers being stuck in it for as many as five, and moving less than an average of two miles per day. I could give you more statistics or insane traffic stories, but I think you get the idea. Traffic, and therefore roads, are an integral part of our modern world and society, and for this reason I think they're an interesting place to study from a spatial theory perspective. <laughs> One of the defining characteristics of modern ground transportation is the GPS, or the Global Positioning System. Ever since the USSR sent Sputnik into space in 1957, humans have been looking for ways to use these artificial satellites to our advantage. GPS began being developed by the U.S. Department of Defense in 1973 and became fully operational in 1995. It's been increasing in popularity ever since, and today it's available worldwide to anyone with an oper operational receiver. Russia has its GPI, GPS equivalent, the Global Navigation Satellite System, and the European Union is currently building its Galileo system for the same purpose, but for this discussion let's stick to the GPS since it has the longest history. GPS has no doubt made driving easier, or at least it's made finding your destination easier. It's turn. Wait, 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 no, 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 it means bear right. No, Up there. it said right, so take a right. No, 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 look, it, it means go up to the right, bear right, over the bridge, and hook up with 307. Like a right Maybe it's turn. a shortcut way. It's like go to the right. It can't mean that. There's a light there. It knows it's where it's going. The, the light. machine knows. The light. Stop yelling at me. No, it's not yelling. There's no light here. Recently, GPS systems have been developed to include real-time traffic information. Asking directions from anyone other than your phone has really become an anachronism. People have been trying to develop most accurate maps since the earliest humans, and GPS is really just the most modern. I would also make the argument that, in a way, GPS is the modern-day equivalent of the Mercator projection. The Mercator projection is a representation of the world developed by the Flemish geographer and cartographer Gerardus Mercator in 1569. The projection is still popular around the world. What it does is distort certain places on the map, not giving accurate representations of landmass sizes around the globe, but in the process giving a projection that was more useful to travelers at the time because they could find the most direct routes. The GPS is similar to this. The little rectangular square screen often doesn't project the world as it is, but is something that can accurately, accurately be understood by the driver. On top of this, as someone driving, driving being guided by GPS is no longer the leader of the trip, but just someone following direction, We've also, in a way, become more flaneurs the more GPS devices we use. We don't have to pay as much attention to road signs and are therefore more able to pay attention to what's happening around us as we drive. So, modern traffic is defined by the sheer volume and the ways that we deal with it through things like the GPS. But when I say the word traffic, what do I mean exactly? Well, the word probably comes from the Latin phrase transficare, which means to rub across. Then, in the Middle Ages, it started to mean trade and commerce. The first modern usage of the word, meaning people and vehicles going and coming, was in 1825, and it was in Arabic. And in 1917, traffic jam was the, used for the first time. Modern traffic, though, doesn't just happen. It gets created by us. And when it gets created, it's on roads. This relates directly to the idea by the f philosopher Henry, Henry Lefebvre, that social space is a social product. Traffic is definitely a social space, and we, we create it because in our social culture, we have places to go. This is also, I think, a good place to m mention the geographer Yifu Tuan 
in what he said in his book, Place and Space, the Perspective of Experience, that space becomes place when it occasions a pause. This is a statement that I think has a lot of merit, but if you think about it next time you're stuck behind a semi and not moving, it's probably just going to seem like a cruel joke. Anyways, back to what I was talking about. Traffic takes place on roads, and roads, in America at least, hold the unique distinction of being possibly the only place that every functioning member of society uses. Even if you don't have a car, you're sure to walk or ride your bike or take public transportation, and all of these go along roads. In 2013, President Obama and the U.S. Department of Transportation outlined a six-year spending plan, the budget of which was put at $492 billion. That alone should tell you how much we care about our roads and our traffic. Because we all use this space, the road is one of the places that brings us together as a culture. For instance, say you're seeing your in-laws for the first time in months or years, and you really don't know them all that well, there's a good chance one of the first things they'll ask you is, how was the drive? Because they know, no matter who you are, you probably have some opinion on how the drive was. Another way we in our culture interact with each other through roads and traffic is by giving directions. If someone asked me how to get to the Fashion Square Mall from UCF, I'm going to tell them, turn left onto Alpha Drive, then right onto University, then take 417 South on your right, then take the exits onto Colonial Drive, and then it'll be a few miles down on your right. What's happening here? Well, sure, I'm giving directions. What's also happening is that I'm conveying a form of parataxis. Parataxis is a technique often used in literature or sh of using short, simple sentences to convey a message. Now, I've given you direction, but unfortunately for you, it's 5.15 on a workday. You're probably going to get stuck in traffic, and you're probably going to get frustrated. Why? Well, when Princeton University psychology professor Daniel Kahneman surveyed a group of women about different experiences they had throughout the day their, and their enjoyment of them, commuting came in last. Why do we hate traffic so much? I think you could make the argument that you have more to do in your car today than someone 200 years ago might have had to do in their house. Here's a theoretical situation. You're in your car, and you have the American average one-hour drive to work in front of you. One thing you could do on the way is eat an almost limitless range of food, from fruits to sandwiches to protein bars to those weird drinkable soup cup things. There's not just a range of food being able to be eaten while you're driving, but specifically designed for it. Then, while you're eating, you could also turn on the radio and hear news from the other side of the world. You could listen to one of the songs from a lim limit literally limitless supply of music that's been recorded for the last hundred years or so. You could, you know, learn a new language, listen to a book on tape, take a college level course. And this whole time, while you're doing this, you could be interrupted by your best friend that you haven't seen in years, who's calling you from the other side of the world to tell you that they just had a baby that was born literally minutes ago. But if on your way to work, someone in front of you gets into a fender better and your drive takes 15 minutes longer than usually does, you're going to get pissed. Why? Sure, you could say it's because you're going to be late, but even if you're going home and you have nowhere to be, you're probably going to be angry. So I don't think this argument has any merit. In Tom Vanderbilt's book, Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do and What It Says About Us, he quotes Harvard psychologist Daniel Gilbert saying that we get frustrated in traffic because it's so unpredictable. We, as humans, like routine, and we like knowing things. And traffic is something that will never be the same, and therefore we'll never never really know it. Thus, we get frustrated. This makes sense. It's like, take the new Star Wars movie, for example. What if it comes out and all of a sudden Chewbacca can fly? People are going to get so angry because everything they know about Chewbacca says he cannot fly. And just like Chewbacca, we can't fly, so we have to continue to use roads. This brings us back to spatial theory and my own personal opinion on why I think traffic upsets us so much. I think we, as a culture, are conditioned to see roads as a lineal space. They're not for stopping. They're from going from point A to point B. This, in this way, they're kind of like a doorway. Can you imagine if you got home from work and you had to wait in the doorway for 15 minutes because your spouse tripped over the dog and you had to wait while they argued over whose insurance was going to pay for it? You'd probably be pretty upset. That's because if we stop on a road, it goes from a lineal space to a static space. And at this point, our mind starts telling us to start moving because this is not a place we're supposed to be. But of course, we can't move because there's hundreds of other cars in the way. This leads us to become aggressive because it goes against an evolutionary instinct in humans called reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is the behavior present in both humans and other organisms, which is summed up easily as, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. In Vanderbilt's book, evolutionary biologist Jay Fellum describes this phenomena. He talks about when humans were evolving, how they were mostly in groups of about 100 individuals or so. 
That way you could keep tabs on everyone else. And if you scratch someone's back, you could make sure at some point they scratch yours. But today, if you've ever seen an aerial view of Los Angeles during rush hour, there's a lot more than 100 people you're going to be interacting with. Because of this, people are less likely to act in the benefit of traffic as a whole, and they start becoming egocentric. They start to do things to only help themselves, because they know that if they scratch someone's back, maybe by letting them into their lane, there's very little chance that that reciprocation will take place, because they're never going to see that person again. This bothers us as humans, because we've been told through millions of years of evolution that things like this are not supposed to happen. We've been told that if we let someone in, or give them some of our berries, at some point we'll be repaid for this, and when we're not, we see it as not being fair. Now, if we hate driving so much, why do we continue to do it? One example might be that, for us, driving is just worth it. In the 2004 paper, Stress That Doesn't Pay Off, The Commuting Paradox, Swiss researchers Alois Stutzer and Bruno S. Frey tried to calculate the cost of commuting based on things like fiscal costs, added stress, and lost time. Then they compared it to the rewards of driving, which often manifested itself as a higher paying job, a nicer house, or being close to friends or relatives. And to the conclusion of the paper, they said that based on their research, an extra 23 minutes of driving made a 17% salary increase worth it for the subjects. This is interesting, but it's a very simplified study on the subject and leads to many complications. One such complication is what is known as hedonic adaption. Hedonic adaption is something humans have evolved to have in their DNA that allows us to survive in a variety of environments and situations. An easy way to describe it is, no matter what happens to you in life, you'll quickly get used to it. This is explained in the 1978 psychology paper by Philip Brickman, Dan Coates, and Ronnie Jehoff Bullman. Lottery winners and accident victims is happiness relative? In this study, they, survived, they surveyed three groups of people, recent lottery winners, recent paraplegic victims, and a control group. They asked people to rate their happiness before their change in fortune and then right after, and then they kept up with them through the, in their happiness levels for the following months. What they found was that, as you might expect, happiness spiked or fell drastically immediately after the incident, but then, a little surprisingly, it would return to normal pretty quickly, sometimes in just two months. So, if we're to compare living, winning the lottery to driving an extra 20 minutes so you can have your dream house or make more money... There, this research suggests that while you might think it's worth it at the time, there's a good chance that over the long haul, you're not going to be any happier than if you would have just stayed put. The flip side of this, another reason why we might drive so far, is what economist Robert H. Frank calls the Aspen Effect. The Aspen Effect takes its name from the affluent Colorado town that, as it became more wealthy, forced middle and working class people to move further and further away from the town to find affordable housing. What's happened is that working class people like firefighters, teachers, restaurant and retail workers commute is farther than ever and consequently the traffic in and out of Aspen has become horrendous. In, in a 2001 New York Times op-ed, Frank argued that, as is illustrated in the greater Aspen area, it's growing wealth inequality that's contributing to the increased commute times in America. What's really the answer and what are we to make of all this? Well, it's probably a combination of all these things. which. I think is part of the reason why roads are so unique and so fascinating. You can see from a lot of the information I gave you just how important roads are to our culture, and you can see that, although I barely scratch the surface, there are many different ways to look at roads and traffic. What I think to, is important to remember about roads is that, although we spend a lot of time by ourselves on them, they are most definitely a social space, and they connect us as much as almost anything else in our culture. And on top of that, there are so many factors affecting how we see and interact with roads that they are one of the most complex and interesting spaces in the world today. Thank you. Quand elle eut 